I probably go to the studio. What? Studio. Did I just have to do it? Oh. You built like a great studio. So you got the GPG one is at 1700. So music, and he's got like and, coming in. Oh wait, I take that. Oh yeah, yeah. And the last workshop, our uh, bar camp, is at 1600. So it'll be right after the last bar camp. Yeah. It looks like uh, looks like two o'clock. So we'll go ahead and get started. My name is David Nally. I'm employed to work on cloud stack. Uh, this apparently is the cloud room since every talk is about something cloud here. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on what CloudStack is, uh, it's uh, infrastructure as a service platform. It's licensed under the GDL v3. We started, yeah, it's far too hot. We'll, we'll, take the, we'll take the noise from outside. Okay, we'll just take the noise from outside. Um, I'm dying here. <laughs> So uh, the company that originally started work on it was founded in 2008. Uh, they initially ran with an open core uh, licensing model, so they had some reserved features like uh, metering and uh, usage reporting uh, and VMware support and a few other things that were that were held back from open source. And uh, then of course they had the open source side which was everything else. In 2011, in July of 2011, uh, that company, which was cloud.com, was acquired. Um, it was acquired by Citrix, uh, who has a stunning record with open source projects. Um, and you know, I think that's something that, that they know as well. But um, they, uh, they allowed us to take everything open source, so all the file stacks now under the GPLv3. And, um, and we're moving forward. So it's been in development a little over three years now. Um, we just kicked out some uh, the first beta builds for 3.0 here recently. Uh, it's a multi-hypervisor platform. So currently we support uh, KVM, Send Server, Send File Platform, uh, Oracle VM. Hyper V is coming later this quarter. Um, VMware support's already there. Um, and there's some other people who are working on things like LXC and stuff that aren't real hypervisors. We support bare metal as well. Um, and I'll be happy to show that all, uh, show off a little bit about what CloudStack can do. Currently, however, CloudStack is not in Nora. Um, why is that? Well, you know, the reason for that is... Like features slash... Uh, yeah, that's a, it's really oh, that that So, here are our list of dependencies. Yeah, we've been... We've been it's familiar somehow. It, it's very familiar. As a matter of fact, I've got several co-maintainer requests to send to uh, Mr. Graham. Uh, because, because he's... Uh, we're, we're doing a lot of the same packages. Um, so... Uh, there are, I think, on this list, which is now outdated, there are two, there are two dependencies which aren't filled. Um, this is now in Fedora, or at least in updates testing. Uh, this one is still outstanding. Um, and then once I get that in, I've got to actually get cloud stack in. Um, and there are a couple of people. Uh, Citrix employs a couple of Fedora package maintainers. Um, Eric Christensen, myself, and um, Michael Young, um, and so we are actively working on pushing uh, CloudStack in. Hopefully, we'll make it by uh, feature freeze uh, for F17. We'll see. Um, so that's kind of the state of, of where things are and, and what needs to uh, happen is is essentially I've got this one massive. Uh, jar file that is going to be very painful to build because everything Java must be painful and of course they have to choose Java um, as, a, as the language to develop in. So uh, if you haven't read Greg's blog post on why the ISV say didn't kick off, his, his points are uh, especially poignant for Java folks um, and uh, he points out a lot of the pain. Um, so currently, we build 
we build binaries for Fedora and Ubuntu and, of course, EL5 and EL6. Our plan is to get this into Fedora and stop building, uh, stop shipping our own binaries for Fedora. We'll, ship, uh, we'll just ship into this for, uh I don't think we'll get to the point where we're actively pushing into Apple, but we'll see. Um, so I've got both a, a 2.2, which is our current instance, and a 3.0 instance, and I apologize for the uh, huge branding. Uh, um, I've actually been arguing about getting rid of that, and I think we're going to. Um, so this is the, the CloudStack dashboard. We have a, a couple of things that are somewhat unique. Um, we have this idea of secondary storage, which is where we store templates uh, for machines that are going to be published. And it's where we store um, snapshots, which are lazy man's backups, uh, or poor backups. Um, and then we have primary storage, which is, of course, where the virtual machine disk images are actually running. Um, so, uh, and this particular one is, has been hastily thrown up, and I'll apologize because there's only a single hypervisor. Um, well, I'm leaving it. Oh, sorry. Um, so, this gives a, a decent picture. You'll see here that we're effectively using something else to route, uh, to route into this, uh, in for our public addresses, and all of the uh, all of the virtual machines are getting addresses in the guest network, uh, and you can see some of the, the things we're doing. As right now, we've got uh, a virtual router, which is essentially a router running in a virtual machine, configured and running, and uh, and that's what we're using. But we could also use um, a Juniper SRX uh, if you want to do load balancers. We can do Netscaler or F5 Big IP. Um, and we will actually handle configuration of those on the fly. So as you add additional posts, we'll reach out to the F5 and, uh, and go ahead and, and take care of configuring that. Um, we've essentially made the design decision, though, that we will not support any network device that does not have an API. So you won't see any Cisco stuff anytime soon because they all want you to connect to their terminal and, and do things uh, from their, their terminal. To, uh, configure. Um, Have you looked at any of the Brocade stuff and what is the plan support? So Brocade is actually uh, working on having um, support into CloudStack. They're, they are, uh, they've actually, their legal department is waiting through the contributor agreements right now. Um, and uh, which is essentially a, a copy of the Apache software license or Apache software foundations license agreements. Uh, so we think that they are going to actually contribute Brocade support into CloudStack. Uh, we are not targeting them yet, but, uh, uh, especially if they'll do the work for us. Um, right now, it, it is pretty sparse as far as external hardware, some Juniper hardware, uh, F5 hardware, and, and of course Netscape. Um, and we've come to this, uh, we've essentially come to this uh, situation where and it's actually easier to show you in 2.2 if I haven't been logged out already. Where we're offering a set of services, network services. So if I take if I take a IP address, I can uh, depending upon the network or depending upon the service offering that I offer to a given account. Um, I can offer them a VPN so that they can have a VPN endpoint to connect into their network. I can do load balancer and and by default the load balancer is running off that virtual router which is uh, running HA proxy uh, and you can you can configure the algorithms and, and very basic ports uh, but that's about it. Um, or you could also have this uh, managing your F5 and so the end user can actually come in and, and set up Oh, I want to add a load balancer for my machines. Uh, you can do port forwarding firewall stuff as well. Um, and then, of course, you're, you're effectively assigning this uh, to, uh, to a machine. Unless it's a load balancer and you're assigning it to multiple machines. So 
we're, we're essentially uh, coming across with this networking as a service type of, of offering where uh, when people who set up the platform come in and set up the uh, file stack, they say, these are the network options I will expose to my users. And then the users can then go and, and provision whatever services out of that collection that they want to uh, they want to provide. And we're working on adding some some additional things. There's some folks who are working on OSPF and, and BGP for uh, geographically disparate setups. Um, and so we have this we have this idea of domains uh, within CloudStack and. They are essentially a way for you to aggregate accounts. So, if Fedora had, uh, if we had a Fedora domain here, we would subdivide it into infrastructure, and then sysadmin uh, web and sysadmin uh, um, sysadmin hosted would be subdomains or would be accounts under infrastructure, and then under those accounts there would be um, there would actually be users. And that allows you to put limits at each of these levels. So you may say, I will allow uh, the Fedora domain to have 50 instances, 35 public IP addresses, uh, this many volumes, etc. And you can apply those uh, restrictions to uh, to each of these uh, domains, and they they will also aggregate down. So if Fedora has 50 and infrastructure has 25, if uh, if release engineering comes along and, and consumes more than, than their allotment, then uh, infrastructure might hit the, uh, the upper Fedora threshold, which would be applied to them because they're part of that domain. Um, and at the same time, not yet have hit their own personal or their own individual, uh, their own individual resource limits. Um, this, is, this is essentially designed uh, to be from the ground up, multi-tenant. Our our original users were um, were large uh, cloud service providers, so GoDaddy and uh, Tata Communications and folks like that who who will have data centers around the world, and uh, you know they want their their customers to be able to perhaps choose where they're deploying it, but they it all needs to be managed from a single place. So we have this idea of zones which are analogous to EC2 availability zones. We have uh, an idea of pods which, uh, which will share um, uh, some guest networking levels. Uh, a zone will share secondary storage and, uh, and overall networking. A pod will share uh, guest networking. And then down cluster level, the clusters have to be homogenous within the cluster. So a cluster would contain uh, KVM nodes, and that way we can migrate machines back and forth. So we have this thing that marketing likes to call high availability, uh, which is why we require um, why we require the clusters to be homogenous, and they use that shared primary storage uh, within the cluster. Uh, and so if a machine goes down, uh, all of the virtual machines that are marked as high availability. Um, we'll get restarted on different hardware, or of course we may migrate if we start seeing problems, and, uh, and of course if, if the VM itself goes down, we'll try and restart it. Um, they call it high availability, I call it very rapid mean time for recovery, but HA looks so much cooler on a marketing lawsuit. So. Um, and uh, we, we've added this idea of, uh, of projects, so essentially we ran into, particularly in private clouds, where we would have groups that would be in, uh, in separate accounts uh, because they're getting charged back, they're charging back to, uh, to customers or to, to the individual business units. And uh, even though they were in different accounts, they needed to collaborate. So essentially projects allow you to share, um, to share resources across accounts and at the same time, all of the accounting stuff goes back to that project as opposed to uh, just a single account. So you can uh, break things out that way. Uh, we have a few different, few different uh, networking models, and, and networking is one of the veins of infrastructure as a service. 
we have this uh, networking model that someone dubbed BASIC because it's a, effectively a flat layer two network that does isolation at layer three. Uh, so essentially the bridge device in the hypervisor is where they do all of the filtering. And so all of the firewall rules are spread all across each hypervisor and each hypervisor has a copy of those firewall rules and they get applied at the bridge so that handles uh, inter-VM uh, communication as well as stuff that's uh, intra-hypervisor. Um, and so it, it, that, that uh, bridge device effectively becomes the choke point. Um, so they call that basic networking. That scales really, really well. Um, we have the, the largest private cloud instance that I'm aware of is 15,000 plus physical nodes. And they're doing basic networking because VLANs don't scale for them. Uh, obviously, VLANs have the 4,096 hard limit. Um, and honestly, the you know, cloud is about uh, commodity computing and you can't route 4,000 VLANs on commodity switches. Um, typically, you're talking six figures when you're talking being able to actually handle the routing for those 4,000 VLANs. Um, so typically with what you would consider standard data center grade switches um, that you would want to deploy to that kind of uh, number of hosts, you would be talking, you know, handling a thousand VLANs. Um, and if you've got to do a high level of separation, that simply doesn't, doesn't scale. So the largest, uh, the largest scale uh, folks are doing that basic, which is really direct untagged networking. We'll also support doing the VLANs and managing VLANs, uh, including allocation of VLANs to accounts, so that at a minimum, each account would get its own VLAN to isolate traffic. And, uh, and with the networking as a service, they can also request additional VLANs with the assumption that you've got some back-end method to either charge to the business unit or charge to the customer. Um, and, uh, so you'll also see uh, you'll also see some folks who say, "Yeah, it's great that you can do that. I've already got a very very robust uh, network in place. I want to use my networking hardware, and essentially all we'll do is provide DHCP. So essentially we'll use their external router. Assume everything is set up. We won't do any routing, um, and we'll handle we'll handle just providing DHCP to the machines and." Uh, uh, so we can take advantage, even if we're not directly managing the router itself, like we would in the case of a Juniper SRX. Um, we can handle, uh, we can just take the, the essentially the trunk in. We'll take care of uh, configuring the hypervisors to, to uh, have BIFs set up for those VLANs and go from there. So I've been running my mouth now for almost 20 minutes. Anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. One, one stupid question. You mentioned that the firewall rules are, are copied across the hypervisors at the bridge level. Supposing I have a rule where I block a certain port, and, but it's needed by VMs in another hypervisor. Do I have to write two rules for that? or? So, so the, um, those sets of rules are account specific. Okay. And, and at a minimum account specific, right? So, so you may say, I'm applying this set of rules to these machines, and those machines will say, I'm looking for the set of rules in rule set 3357, and those rules will handle the traffic going to them. The bridge effectively is acting as the, uh, is acting as the, um, the firewall that's applying the ACL list, and it's saying, oh, well, here are the rules for 3357, but they're getting copied to all the hypervisors because you can't right. you can't necessarily control where a machine will get migrated to, or where another machine that <coughs> is, uh, that you say, hey, I need that same set of uh, uh, security groups applied to this machine. You can't control where it's going to get applied, so it has to be it has to be pushed across all of them. So that may mean. You know that one of your machines that has port 80 open because you've set a uh, firewall rule to allow port 80 in gets the, uh, provisioned on KVM, and the next one gets the provisioned on Zen server, 
and you know if the networks are effectively going to be the same, that the end user doesn't know that they're running on different hardware or different uh, different hypervisors. They're just magically provisioned there and and come up. Are bonded interfaces supported? Yes. Yeah. Most most folks do use um, bonded interfaces at least for their guest traffic. Uh, we have some folks who are doing bonded interfaces for their storage traffic because storage IO tends to be pretty high, um, especially if they're using shared storage. People are doing, you know, ephemeral instances will use local storage, but you don't get you know, the ability to uh, to rebalance uh, load across a cluster or across a set of clusters in that manner. Um, you, you're essentially stuck with whatever's there. So you may have load really high on a single machine um, as opposed to another. And, and effectively right now we have, we have a set of algorithms. Uh, we have three defaults right now that shift. The first is first fill. So if um, uh, the first machine, first cluster that we come across that has access to storage and access to networking that meets the needs of, of the provisioning request. Uh, the first one we come across will fill it up. We also have max dispersion. So uh, it will take, a, on an account basis, uh, it will say, all right, this guy just provisioned a host on host 53. The next one needs to be as far away from host 53 as possible. Go deploy it there uh, to basically limit the effects of outages on a single account. Um, and that's done at the account level rather than total load. Um, we also have uh, fill everything up first. And so uh, we've got some folks who are effectively shutting down hypervisors uh, using some of the bare metal stuff. And uh, you know, as they get close to capacity, they'll bring additional hypervisors up um, uh, to, to handle the future load increases. But they're filling it all up uh, each machine up before they move to the next one. What sort of shared storage models are you supporting for primary storage? Um, so with primary storage, most folks, uh, and this is a, this is certainly a legacy way of thinking, most folks are doing NFS or iSCSI, and we support those out of the box. Uh, I mean, we'll even go and configure the hypervisor to connect to NFS or iSCSI. We just added uh, clustered LVM. Uh, some guy in Belarus wanted clustered LVM support for KVM, and he wrote it and added it uh, a month or two ago, and it just emerged in the 3.0 beta. Um, we have uh, we have a number of people who are using Gluster, um, but they're they're essentially having to mount uh, mount it on all of their hosts, and they're doing it in KVM. Um, so. We have this idea of a shared mount point. You tell us the directory where uh, your shared file system is mounted, and we'll use it. And so anything that can be written to, so we've got some people, we've got a lot of people who are using OCFS2 with Oracle VM uh, and with KVM. We've got a lot of people who are using GFS2, um, but certainly Gluster has the most traction with us. Um, uh, we actually have a guy in Iceland who, who has it written so that the, um, so that uh, in the GUI and in the API, um, you can uh, you can configure cluster uh, your cluster mount points uh, using the Fuse client, um, and we are trying to. He's sadly on a on a much older version. We're trying to get that code cleaned up and and uh, hopefully into the, our Q2 release. Um, uh, there are some other people who are playing with things like Ceph. Um, and I mean, some of the more exotic shared file storage. There's some people who want Sheepdog uh, support and uh, and are trying to play with that. But of course, Sheepdog is not true file storage, and uh, um, much like Ceph has uh, the Rados option. Um, but uh, so that is not yet in. But but uh, there are people who are playing with it and trying to actively use it. If we were using Gluster, could we allocate the full Bronto byte? You know, I don't know. I don't know that anyone's tried. 
<laughs> you just wanted to say Bronco Bike. I'm going to say it. I got three more times today. I got to say it. <laughs> you know, it's not the official term. Uh, it's what is that? It's not an, there is no official term. That is really not official. I could use one. 10 to 27 bits. Bronco Bike. So. <laughs> So I don't know. I I know that uh, I know that some of the uh, some of the larger places are in excess of a petabyte of storage, but they're of course uh, digging that up. Um, it's not. I've got this one one uh, multi petabyte uh, um, storage array that I'm exposing. They're exposing that as as much smaller chunks because uh, primary storage is allocated to the cluster level because that cluster will all share the storage and, and be able to migrate them back and forth between machines. And, and you don't want that clusters uh, to have to deal with a, a ton of IO weight. So effectively, you're trying to minimize that, and which is really a good, a good entry point for, um, for distributed storage. Um, you know, as opposed to a single SAN head that you keep having to add uh, you know, your fiber channel Next to, so. yeah, unrelated question. Um, sure. Are you guys? I saw Libvirt on the list of dependencies yeah. as far as Libvirt Java. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you guys using that solely for KVM, or are you using it for solely other? Solely for KVM. Okay. Um, and and this, effectively, the issue is um, version differences between um, EL5 and EL6, which are our two supported platforms, um, and. A lot of the stuff, a lot of the high-end stuff for VMware and Zen Server and some of the other platforms that we're targeting just aren't in some of those EL5 versions of Libvirt, mm -hmm. and some of them not even in the EL6 versions of Libvirt. Yep. And so it makes sense for us to manage KVM that way. Um, but I mean, there's some of the things we want to do with um, some of the things we want to do with Ceph, for instance. Um, aren't in the EL6 version of Libvirt. And so do we start going outside of Libvirt to do that and do it straight in QEMU or you know, wait till Rails 7 and hope it's in there? Um, so I don't know. I, right now we're doing most of the, the VM functions uh, there. We do a lot of stuff outside of that, but we're trying to keep as close to Libvirt as possible. Yeah, I mean, you definitely can differentiate between using Libvirt for VM lifecycle functionality versus sure. using it for storage and network management functionality. Yes. And I think long term, the storage and network functionality will probably eventually move outside of Libvirt anyway. Because it's, oh, really? it's it, well, who knows if it'll end up that way, but that's that's one possible way. It is one possibility. Yeah. And, and so, so we actually have a client that, uh, that sits on KVM nodes um, simply because we ran into problems with differences between EL5 and EL6. And for a while, we were even trying to patch uh, QMU and EL5, and we've still got one patch that's been upstreamed into, into uh, QEMU that isn't in EL6 that uh, I keep harassing Justin Forbes about, um, trying to get that included into perhaps 6.3 or something, so we can stop patching that. Um, Yes, and, and I appreciate that. and I appreciate that it moves very slowly as well, um, uh, and that's one of the nice things about Fedora moving so fast. All of those changes we've already got committed upstream are have been in uh, have been in Fedora since Fedora 15, I think. So um, uh, it should be a problem there, uh, and hopefully Rail 7 will of course incorporate them simply because it's going to have a newer looker. Anything? I have well, this is more of a common question, but I know you have the little storage tab yeah. over here, and I've seen this presentation a couple times. Isn't there like a way where you guys drop down what kind of exposed all the file system information in there were? Like that? No. Yeah. So this is actually the volumes. This isn't the raw storage. Oh. What you're looking for <laughs> is so this do this in there. Have a pretty graph. I can slide down, and you can see 
all the primary storage within that. And then there's also a oh, perfectly a useless thing. dashboard. <laughs> and I say it's perfectly useless because it's showing you system-wide capacity. And, you know, if you're, so we had a guy who, who essentially told us we couldn't do basic math because he kept seeing all of this available storage, but it was spread out across 20 different storage devices, mm -hmm. and he never had the ability to, to push it everywhere. Um, he was from a very, very large company, and uh, um, it was a very interesting conversation because then he said, so why do we have the dashboard? And it's nice for a managerial view, and, and I guess those aggregate things are nice, but you really want to be looking uh, at some some far more granular results, and so um, there's a Nagios uh, plugin for CloudStack and a Zenos plugin for CloudStack, and there's about to be a Savix plugin for CloudStack. But actually, go and look at these, and we'll alert at the cluster level when you start running out of storage or uh, or secondary storage, etc. Or of course, memory or CPU. <coughs> But yeah, this this mile high overview, um, I I think it's a nice thing to say. Ooh, look at how much we're using of of all of our capacity. But I think if from a sysadmin perspective, it's useful. Um, so GUIs are cool. Not really. Nobody uses um, GUIs to do real work. Um, instead, they use an actual API. And so we've got a uh, relatively well-documented API that will return um, that will return answers in either JSON or uh, XML. Um, we've got uh, I think we've got every abstraction layer now covered to some degree. Uh, we at least have user-level stuff in most of the abstraction layers, aside from Aeolus. Um, and I don't see snow here. I'm just going to harass him again. But um, so libcloud, fog, jclouds. Um, I think there's a couple of others. Decent. Um, sorry. Decent. I don't know that Decent. one. The Instratus guys. Oh, Instratus. Yeah, Instratus supports this. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of. Uh, it seems like there's a couple of others out there. Uh, Scalar. Um, uh, if you consider it an abstraction layer of right scale, um, we are we and Yuka are the uh, are their two private cloud options. So if you want to use their bridging capabilities and run some stuff on your own hardware, you'll decide either to run a cloud stack cloud internally or a Yuka cloud and manage it from right scales. Right scale will effectively provide you that management server and you provide everything else and and you can move your instances between EC2 and CloudStack. We do have an EC2 API uh, interoperability layer. Um, we have a number of people who are using it very effectively. I think it's horribly broken. Um, the reason I think it's horribly broken is it doesn't work with uh, Yuka. So I can't use Yuka tools to, to do things with it. I can use the straight EC2 tools. I also can't use Elastic, Fox, or any of the other big EC2 tools, um, but we do have a lot of folks who are who are uh, very heavily using the EC2 uh, API translation there. We have. So this is uh, this is GPLv3. If you want to play with it, uh, we hang out on Hash Cloud Stack um, uh, on the free node, and you're welcome to come join us. We would uh, if you want to. Help us get EH cache packaged, and you're a masochist that enjoys Java packaging. I would certainly love to have some help. So yeah, curious, and what did you use to create the, the API documentation? Um, it's not course? Java doc, but okay. it's uh, it's it's one of the tools built into Ant. We have an Ant target okay. that builds this. Okay. It is not Java doc, and I forget what it is now. Okay. And if you don't have any other questions, you're welcome to acquire swag from me. It's incredibly hot, so 
Um, I will shut up now. Is it an H-A-W-T? <laughs> no, Do you have is, sweaters in there? It is, <laughs> it is very hot in here. While I think cloud stack is perfectly hot, um, the, the temperature is annoying. Uh, so feel free to grab a shirt or uh, I think I've got stickers up here too. If you want to paper your laptop with stickers. Um, and if you have questions, I'm happy to talk. Um, Good job. Thank you.